Hey, welcome to Tabletop Skirmish Games. I'm Lee, and in this video, I'll be taking you through a complete beginner's guide to how to play Horus Heresy. This video is broken down into six parts, and it takes you through all the basic rules you need to play your first game of Horus Heresy. These six parts are also available as separate videos, but in this video I've edited them all together so you can watch it all in one place. I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope it serves as a good way for you to get a nice overview of the basic rules. Let's begin with part one, the introduction and general principles of the game. Before we do that though, I'd like to say a huge thank you to this month's sponsors who are making these daily videos possible. And I'll put their links in the comments section below. And if you can check those out, that's a great way to support the channel and help me to keep these videos coming. Right, let's get started with the common principles and game mechanics. Let's look at measuring distances and you can use the measuring stick provided or a tape measure. And the measurement is always in inches and you measure from the closest point on one base to the closest point on the other base. And this can be between models or even terrain features. The dice for the game will be a six sided dice known as a D6. Sometimes though, you'll be asked to roll a D3. When you need to do this, simply roll a D6 and halve the number rounding up. So a one or two would be a one, three or four would be a two, and a five or six would be a three. Sometimes you'll be asked to roll a d66, and to do this, you roll two dice, one after the other. The first dice will count as the tens, and the second dice will count as the units. So if you roll a three on the first dice and a five on the second, your d66 result will be a 35. You'll also be using a scatter dice, and this will be mostly used to determine a random direction for things like blast weapons. Often throughout the game, you'll have to modify your dice rolls. Now, a roll of an unmodified one will always fail, and a roll of an unmodified six will always succeed, unless another rule states otherwise. Any modifications that you need to add to your dice roll will be written as D6 plus one or D6 plus two. In some situations, the rules allow you to re-roll a dice. And the second roll that you make counts, even if it means a worse result than the first. If you've rolled a 2d6 and you want to re-roll it, you must re-roll all of the dice. Some rules will require you to roll off. So each player rolls a dice and the player who rolls the highest result wins the roll off. That takes care of the dice, but now let's have a look at blast markers and templates. Some weapons are so powerful that they don't just target a single model or unit, but have an area effect. To represent the area of effect, we'll use a small blast marker with a three inch diameter, a large blast marker for a five inch diameter, or a template, which is the teardrop shaped template, roughly eight inches long. To work out the number of hits, you'll normally hold the whole of the marker or template over the head of a particular model. The weapons will give you the rules and directions you need to follow when using these markers and templates. Sometimes you'll need to scatter a unit, model, or a counter. And so to do this, you place the object on the battlefield as instructed by the rule. Then roll a scatter dice and 2d6 to determine the direction and distance of scatter in inches. If a hit is rolled on the scatter dice, the object does not move. Leave it in place and resolve the remainder of the rule. Now let's take a look at characteristic tests and sometimes a model will be called upon to take a characteristic test. To do it, you just follow these steps. Number one, roll a d6 and compare the result to the relevant characteristic in the model's profile. If the result is equal to or less than the number in the profile, the test is passed. If the result is greater than the number in the model's profile, the test has been failed and the model faces the consequences as detailed in the rule 
that prompted the test. You'll often also have to take leadership tests, and this has got a similar procedure. First, you'll roll 2d6 and compare the model's leadership characteristic. If the result is equal to or less than the leadership characteristic, that test has been passed. But if the result is greater than the leadership characteristic, the test has been failed. If a unit has to take a leadership test and it includes models with different leadership values, always use the highest leadership from among them. Let's have a quick look at line of sight next, and we'll be covering this in lots of detail in the shooting phase, but the line of sight rules for Horus Heresy are really good, simple, but effective. For one model to have line of sight to another, you must be able to trace a straight unblocked line from its body to any part of the target's body. Now this doesn't include a model's weapon, banner, or other ornament that they are carrying. As well as being in line of sight, many rules will call for a models to be in range. To be within range of any given point or model, any part of the base of the model, or hull in the case of vehicles, must be within a number of inches stated by the rule in question. We'll also cover this in detail in the shooting video. Now we've gone through the general principles, let's have a look at the 10 characteristics that describe the various attributes of our different models. Here we've got a character profile, and first of all we have M, and this is movement. This represents the number of inches the model can move across the battlefield. WS represents the weapon skill, and this defines the close combat skill a warrior possesses. The higher the characteristic, the more likely the model is to hit an opponent in close combat. BS is ballistic skill, and this shows how accurate a warrior is with ranged weapons. S is for strength, and this gives a measure of how physically capable a warrior is. T is for toughness, and this is a measure of a model's ability to resist physical damage and pain. W is for wounds, and this represents how much damage a model can take before it dies. I is for initiative, and this represents the swiftness of a model. A is for attacks, and this is the number of attacks a model may make during close combat. LD is for leadership, and this reveals how courageous, determined, and self-controlled a model is. And finally, SV, and this represents the armor save, and this is the warrior's chance to avoid harm when it is struck or shot. Some characteristics will have a zero or a dash, and this means they have no ability in that field. As well as its characteristics profile, a unit will have a points value, a unit composition, a unit type, war gear, special rules and options and this will all come into play as we go through the rules in the next videos in the series. Now we've covered the general principles of the game it's time to look at the turn summary and reactions so come and join me for part two of this series where we'll go through all of those things in detail. Let's start with the turn and in Horus Heresy one player will take their turn to move and fight with all their forces. Then their opponent will move and fight in their own turn. This process is then repeated with the first player moving and fighting again and so on until the game is done. During their own turn, the player is referred to as the active player and their opponent, whose turn it isn't, is known as the reactive player. There are three main phases of an active player's turn. These are movement, shooting, and assault. During the movement phase, the active player moves any of their units that are capable of doing so. In the shooting phase, the active player may now make shooting attacks with any of their units that are capable of doing so. In the assault phase, units may move into combat against enemy units in the charge subphase and then trade blows with them in the fight subphase. I'll be going through each of these phases in great detail in the next three videos, 
But when the active player works through each of the three main phases in sequence, the reactive player does not just sit idle. During each phase, the reactive player may make a number of reactions, responses to the active player's actions that give that player a chance to counter their strategies. We'll have a closer look at reactions later on in this video. Once an active player has worked their way through the movement, shooting and assault phases, it's time to make the end of the active player's turn and resolve any rule described as happening at the end of your turn. Once that turn is fully resolved, the players switch roles, the active player now becomes the reactive player and vice versa. This cycle continues until the game ends. Now it's time to look at reactions and this is a great part of the game. Each phase will give you a limited number of reactions to use, so it's really important to learn these and understand the best time to use them during the battle. Let's look at reaction allotments and the reactive player, unless a special rule or other effect specifies otherwise, may make one reaction in each phase of their opponent's turn. While the basic reaction allotment provides the reactive player with a single reaction to use in each phase, it's unlikely that most players will be limited like this. A number of special rules provide additional reactions to the reactive player in specific phases. This means that players may be able to make one, two or three reactions in any single phase, but they may never make more than three. You can find the core reactions that are available to all the armies in the game on page 160 of the core rulebook. Certain armies may also gain access to additional reactions due to faction rules or special rules and you'll find these in the various army books available for Horus Heresy. That's now covered the turn sequence and reactions. So come and join me for part three of this series where we'll look at the movement phase. During the movement phase, the active player can move each of their units up to a distance equal to their movement characteristic. Sometimes a unit will move through difficult terrain and if it chooses to move through difficult terrain, that unit applies a modifier of minus two to the distance it moves in that phase. Now let's talk about which models are moving, because whether or not a model moves can change how effective it will be in the shooting and assault phases. The active player may decide that only some of the models in a unit are going to move this turn. If this is the case, they must declare which models are remaining stationary before moving the other models of that unit, otherwise the entire unit is considered to have moved. But remember that all models in the unit must still maintain their unit coherency. Units can also increase their movement by running. If the active player chooses to run with any of their units, that unit increases their movement by the value of the lowest initiative characteristic in the unit for the duration of the movement phase. A unit that runs may not make shooting attacks during the following shooting phase or declare charges during the assault phase. And if any models in a unit run, then all the models in that unit are counted as having run. Units making a reaction during their opponent's turn may never choose to run as part of that reaction. Let's look at some of the other rules associated with movement. Sometimes a unit will contain models that move at different speeds. When this is the case, each model can move up to its maximum movement allowance as long as it remains in unit coherency. Sometimes models will get in the way and a model cannot move to a position within one inch of an enemy model unless they are charging into combat in the assault phase. This means that your models will have to move around the other models. The active player can choose not to move their models in a unit, but they can choose to pivot them on the spot instead and move them to face in any direction. 
If a model only pivots on the spot, then they count as being stationary for all purposes, including the subsequent shooting attacks. There's an important rule for moving and close combat, and units already locked in combat with the enemy cannot move during the movement phase. Let's look at moving through terrain now. And as part of their move, models can move through, up or over any terrain they encounter, unless the terrain is noted as being impassable. If you decide to climb with your units, then simply add the horizontal distance and the vertical distance the model has moved. Some terrain will have rules that affect how far your models can move, and all these rules can be found on page 220 onwards from the core book. We've talked about unit coherency a little bit, so let's focus on that now. Once a unit has finished moving, the models that comprise it must be no more than two inches horizontally and six inches vertically away from another model in a unit. And this is what is referred to as unit coherency. During the course of a game, a unit can get broken up and lose unit coherency. If this happens, in their next movement phase, the models must be moved in such a way that they restore that unit coherency. If the unit cannot move in its next turn or is unable to restore unit coherency in a single turn, then the models must move to restore unit coherency as soon as they have the opportunity, including by running if they have that option. Now we've covered the basic rules for movement, so come and join me for part four of the series where we'll be looking at the shooting phase. If you're finding this video series helpful and you'd like to support the channel, then there's loads of ways you can do that. You can join my Patreon, buy a copy of my book Weekend Warriors, or leave a super thanks down below. During the shooting phase, the active player can choose any order for their units to shoot in, but must complete all the firing by one unit before moving to the next. There's a seven step sequence for a shooting attack, so let's go through that now. In step one, you nominate a unit to make a shooting attack with. The active player chooses one of their units that's able to make an attack, but has yet to do so this turn. If they wish, the active player may check the distance between units before selecting a unit to make attacks with. Now there are times where you cannot make a shooting attack with a unit, and that is if they are locked in combat, or if they have run this turn. In step two, you choose a target, and the chosen unit may make a shooting attack targeting an enemy unit that it can draw line of sight to. The active player may freely check the distance between units before declaring a target unit. In step three, you select a weapon, and this is the weapon the firing unit is equipped with. All models equipped with a weapon with the same name can now attack the target. Every model that wishes to attack must be within range of at least one visible model in the target unit. Models that cannot see the target or who are not in range cannot make the attack. In step four, you roll to hit. Roll a d6 for each shot fired. A model's ballistic skill determines what must be rolled in order to hit the target. In step five, you roll to wound. And for each attack that hits, roll again to see if it wounds the target. The result needed is determined by comparing the strength of the firing weapon with the majority toughness of the target unit. In step six, you allocate wounds and then remove casualties. Any wounds caused by the firing unit must now be allocated one at a time to a model in the unit chosen by that unit's controlling player that is within line of sight and range of the attacking unit. A saving throw may be made for the model to which the wound is allocated to avoid being wounded. If a model is reduced to zero wounds, it is removed as a casualty. Wounds are then allocated to another model chosen by the controlling player. Continue to allocate wounds 
and take saving throws until all wounds have been resolved. And finally, step 7, you can select another weapon. After resolving all shots from the currently selected weapon, if the firing unit is equipped with differently named weapons that have yet to fire, select another weapon and repeat steps 3 to 6. But note that most models may attack with only one weapon, regardless of how many they are equipped with. There's a handy to wound chart on page 170 of the core book and the reference sheet that came in Age of Darkness, and this is brilliant to use during this shooting phase sequence. When you roll to wound, you'll compare the weapon strength characteristic with the target's toughness characteristic, and this chart is used to do that. The number indicated on the chart is the minimum result on a d6 needed to convert the hit into a wound. You'll notice that some values have a dash, for example, where a weapon strength 2 against a target toughness 8. This indicates that the target cannot be wounded by the attack. Let's look at armor saves next, and to make an armor save, roll a d6 and compare the result to the armor save characteristic of the model that has been allocated the wound. If the dice result is equal to or higher than the model's armor save characteristic, that wound is negated. Some powerful weapons are capable of punching through the thickest armor plates, and these are represented by a weapon having an armor piercing characteristic. If the weapon's armor piercing value is equal to or lower than the model's armor save, then it is sufficiently powerful enough to punch straight through. That target gets no armor save at all. The armor is ineffective against the shot. If the weapon has an AP value of dash, then it has no armor piercing value and will never ignore a target's armor save. Some models will be protected by more than physical armor, and this is where invulnerable saves come into play. An invulnerable save can be taken whenever the model suffers a wound, and the armor piercing value of attacking weapons has no effect on the invulnerable save. If a model is in cover, then it can also make a cover save. Unless stated otherwise, all cover provides a 6 plus save. To be in cover, the target model must be at least 25% obscured from the point of view of at least one attacking model, or if the model occupies area terrain of certain types that give the cover save rule to it. Models in a unit can often be completely obscured, in cover, and receiving no protection of any kind from any terrain. In this case, the wounds cannot be allocated to the obscured models. Now we've gone through the basic rules for shooting and the shooting sequence, let's have a closer look at the weapons and different types. Every weapon has a profile, and you can see here that the weapon will have a name, a range, which is the distance it can shoot in inches, the strength, which can often be expressed as user. So if there's no number there, you'll use the using model's strength. AP is the armor piercing value. And finally, you have the type of weapon. And there are lots of different types, including assault, bomb, melee, rapid fire. And the number following the type of weapon tells you how many shots you can fire with it. The different weapon types will come with their own rules, and these can be found from page 176 onwards in the core book. On page 179 of the core book, you can find this handy chart, which shows you some of those different weapon types and a summary of the rules. You can also find it in the back of the book with the very handy reference guide starting on page 326. Now we've covered the basic rules for shooting, come and join me for part 5 of the series where we'll look at the assault phase. The assault phase is split into two sub-phases, the charge sub-phase and the fight sub-phase. Let's have a look at the charge sub-phase first. In the charge sub-phase, the active player 
declares charges and moves models under their control into close combat. And close combat is where the two units from opposing armies are in base contact with each other. If there are more than two units, it is called a multiple combat. The first step in the charge subphase is to declare a charge. And so you choose a unit in your army that is declaring a charge and nominate the enemy unit it is attempting to charge. Units may not charge if they have already charged in this phase and are now locked in combat, or if they are falling back, and there'll also be some other conditions that prevent them from doing it. Once you've declared a charge, you need to roll the charge distance. So for this, you'll roll 2d6 and then add the charge modifier that's shown on the table on page 181 of the core book. The result of the roll may not exceed a total of 12 or a minimum of 2, no matter what modifiers are applied to the roll. Other factors may also impose a modifier on the charge distance of a unit, for example, terrain features. With the roll result modified, now you've got your charge distance. This is the number of inches your assaulting unit can move as part of its charge. If any model in the target enemy unit is within the rolled charge distance, then the charge is considered to be successful and the controlling player should now make a charge move. But if no model in the target enemy unit is within the charging unit's roll distance charge, then the unit is considered to have failed and a surge move is made. To make a surge move, all the models in a unit must move towards the unit that was the target of the failed charge, but the distance moved is equal to half the value of the charge roll, and that includes any modifiers that were made for the unit. Once the charge roll is resolved, the active player may now choose to attempt a charge with a different unit or move on to the fight subphase. The first step in the fight subphase is to choose a combat. There may be several separate assaults being fought at the same time in different parts of the battlefield. If this is the case, the active player chooses the order in which to resolve the combats, completing each combat before moving on to the next one, and so on until all combats are resolved. In close combat, both players' models will fight, and close combat attacks function in the same way as attacks made in the shooting phase. Each attack that hits has a chance to wound, and the wounded model gets a chance to save. If it fails, is generally removed as a casualty. Initiative determines which units attack first in close combat, and you work through the initiative values of the models involved in close combat from high down to low. This is called the initiative steps, and these will start at 10 going down to 1. At the start of each initiative step, any model whose initiative is equal to the value of the current initiative step that is not in base contact with an enemy model may make a pile-in move. This is a 3-inch move, and models that are piling in must attempt to get as close as possible to one or more of the enemy units locked in this combat. A pile-in move cannot be used to move into base contact with any units that are not already involved in the combat. When making your pile-in moves, the active player moves their unit first. If both players' pile-in moves combined would be insufficient to bring any combatants into base contact, then the combat is considered to have ended. Now we need to determine who can fight. Any model whose initiative is equal to the value of the current initiative step and who is engaged with an enemy model must fight. A model is engaged in combat if either that model is in base contact with an enemy model or that model is in unit coherency with another model from its own unit which is in base contact with an enemy model. Unengaged models cannot attack in close combat. Each engaged model will now make a number of attacks, as indicated on its characteristic profile, plus the following bonus attacks. First is a charge bonus, and this is for engaged models that charge this turn, 
they'll get a plus one attack this turn. The second bonus is the two weapons bonus. An engaged models with two single-handed weapons, often a melee weapon and or pistol in each hand, get plus one attacks. Models with more than two weapons gain no additional benefit, you only get one extra attack. Now we roll to hit, and to make a hit roll, roll a d6 for each attack a model gets to make, and compare the weapon skill of the attacking model to the weapon skill of the target unit. Then consult the to hit chart that you can find on page 186 of the core book to find the minimum result needed on a d6 to hit. Once all to hit rolls have been made in a given initiative step, the controlling player must roll a d6 for each successful hit to see if the attack causes a wound. Now we consult the chart that you can find on the Roll to Wound chart section of page 186 of the core book. Just like with shooting, there will be times where the weapon strength cannot beat the target's toughness and no wounds can be taken. Now we allocate the wounds and first the player whose unit is the target of the attack selects any one model in a unit that is engaged with the enemy unit whose attacks are being resolved. If any model in the target unit has already lost one or more wounds, but has not been removed as a casualty, the wound must always be allocated to such a model. With wounds allocated, the models now must make their saving throws and a damage mitigation roll, but only if that model has any available. For each save that is failed, reduce that model's wounds by one. And if the model is reduced to zero wounds, it is removed as a casualty. Otherwise, continue allocating wounds to the selected model until it is removed or the wound pool is empty. In melee, models do not get cover saves against any wounds from the close combat attacks. But as we went through in the shooting phase, if the wound is caused by a weapon with an AP that ignores the wounded model's armor save, then the save cannot be taken. Invulnerable saves may also be used in close combat. Now we continue this process and fight through each of the initiative steps all the way down to initiative number one. With that complete, it's time to determine the assault results and to decide who's won the combat, total up the number of unsaved wounds inflicted by each side on their opponents. The side that inflicted the most unsaved wounds is the winner and the losing unit must make a morale check and must fall back. If both sides suffer the same number of wounds, the combat is drawn and continues next turn. We'll be covering the morale and fallback rules in the next video. Once all the combat has been resolved, it's time for an end of combat piling. Sometimes models from units that did not fall back are not in base contact with an enemy, and so they'll have to make the three inch pile in move. If a unit's opponents are all either destroyed or falling back, or the end of combat pile in was insufficient, so that is no longer locked in combat, that unit may now consolidate. Consolidating units move up to a number of inches equal to their initiative characteristic in any direction. In a unit with mixed initiative characteristics, use the highest. That covers the basic rules for the assault phase, so come and join me for the final video in this series where we'll be taking a look at the morale phase. This is where we make morale checks, and these are similar to other leadership-based tests. You take them by rolling 2d6 and comparing the total to the unit's leadership value. If the total is equal to or less than the unit's leadership characteristic, the test is passed and the unit does not suffer any ill effects. But if the total is higher than their leadership characteristic, the test is failed and the unit will immediately fall back. The two most common reasons a unit must make a morale check are as follows. Number one, a casualties. This is where a unit loses 25% or more of its current models during a single phase. And the second is where they will lose an assault, and units that lose a close combat, usually from suffering more wounds than they inflicted, 
must pass their morale check to hold their ground. Now let's have a look at the rules for falling back. A fallback move is 2d6 inches, unless a rule specifies otherwise. Each model in the unit moves directly towards their own battlefield edge by the shortest possible route. And if you're playing a mission where there is no own battlefield edge, models move towards the closest battlefield edge instead. Now, if any model from a unit that is falling back moves into contact with a battlefield edge, the entire unit is removed from the game as casualties as it scatters and flees the battle. Usually you'll have to move around terrain and stay one inch away from enemy models, but there is an exception when falling back from close combat. Models falling back from a combat can freely move through all enemy models that were involved in that combat. If any models would end their move less than one inch from one of these enemy models, then extend the fallback move until they are clear. Units that are falling back will have restrictions such as they won't be able to make reactions in any phase. And now these exceptions can be found on page 193 of the core book. Now let's talk about regrouping. And a unit that is falling back must attempt to regroup by taking a leadership test in their movement phase just before they move. If the unit fails this test, then it must immediately continue to fall back. If it passes the test, then it stops falling back and can immediately move a number of inches equal to its initiative. Once a unit has regrouped, it cannot otherwise move, run or charge in the assault phase. However, it can make shooting attacks, but does count as having moved and can only fire snapshots. A unit that has regrouped may make reactions as normal, including those that allow it to move. Regrouping when assaulted can have some dire consequences for your units and units that have charges declared against them while falling back must always test to regroup as soon as the enemy is found to be within charge distance. If the test is failed, the assaulted unit is removed as a casualty at the end of the charge subphase after all charge moves have been completed. But if it's successful, the unit regroups without moving and the fight continues as normal. That now covers the basic rules for the morale phase. And this is the final video in the How to Play Horus Heresy series. So hopefully now you've got everything you need to know to play your first game. But this is only the beginning as there are so many other special rules that you need to look at to grow the game. So from page 194 onwards in the core book, you'll find roles for all the different unit types, for psychic powers, for vehicles, terrain, and everything else that you can add onto your game to make it even more enjoyable and complex. From page 230 of the rulebook, you'll find a special rules section, and this has got lots of information and different rules that you can introduce. On top of that, you've got the different modes of play, and you can choose between narrative play, campaign play, open play, and match play, and these all give you different ways to play and enjoy the game. I hope you enjoyed following along with this series, and I really hope it's given you the tools you need to get started playing your first game of Horus Heresy. If you'd like to pick up a copy of Age of Darkness or any other hobby items, I'll put a link down below to Firestorm Games. If you order from them before the 31st of August, you'll also save an additional 5% on the usual up to 20%, so some big savings to be made there. And you'll also support the channel as I get a small commission from every sale made through that link. Thanks so much for watching. If you did like it, please hit the like button, subscribe for more videos like this, and don't forget to hit the notification bell to join me next time on Tabletop Skirmish Games.